All right. Well, I'd like to introduce our next presentation here at the Planet Microcap Showcase Vancouver in association with Small Cap Discoveries. Getting that down. Uh, our next presentation is from Aziz Rahim Tula, the team from Sabio Holdings. Thank you, Robert. Good morning, everyone. Starting off the day with a presentation by Sabio. Nothing like it. Um, I am Aziz Ryan Tula. I'm the CEO, president, uh, CEO and founder of Sabio. Um, along with me is Saja Premji, our CFO, and Aideen McDermott, who is our uh, head of investor relations. So uh, thank you for coming out to our presentation. We'll start off with disclaimers, because no one likes to get sued. <laughs> and the lawyers need to make their money. I'm going to play a quick video to explain what we do, and then we'll get into the breast tax. Okay, so um, what does Sabia do? And I think that video hopefully explained it. We serve targeted ads for the biggest brands in the world. And so we work with their ad agencies and the brands and we target and we help them reach various audiences including diverse ones. Now, Sabia means wise or experienced in Spanish. And when I started the company, it's been 10 years ago, the mission was to help brands. I, quick background on myself, I started my career uh, at Fox Television for three years, NBC six and a half, went to AT&T for three years, and then went to Opera, the browser company, for another three years. And so in that journey, what I realized was missing was this effectively reaching diverse audiences, which includes female audiences. And when I started the company, roughly 15 to 20 percent of the U.S. population was diverse. Today, Gen Z is 49 percent diverse and growing. And so if you're a brand and you're trying to reach that 12 to 24 audience, running on cable TV or traditional broadcast just doesn't work. Social is your option and streaming is another option. And so, you know, what we are, we're emerging leader in the ad tech space, specifically in streaming TV, ad supported streaming and mobile. We're diversified, we have a diversified blue chip brand of companies, uh, the likes of McDonald's, Ford, GM to name a few. We have a strong footprint in the U.S. 99% uh, of our revenue is coming, it originates, is from the U.S. We're a U.S.-based company. Roughly about, you know, less than 1% is now um, outside of the U.S., which is mainly in Europe, which we just recently launched. Um, we have diverse targeting and capabilities. We have uh, our head offices in Los Angeles, roughly founded in 2015, a little bit before that, but 2015, and we have about a, a little more than 100 people across the world. Um, with the majority of the people here in the U.S. The leadership team includes myself, Saja Premji, who's with me today, and uh, Jason Tong, who is our Senior Vice President of Engineering, along with other key members. We have backgrounds, as I mentioned, at NBC, AT&T, TD Securities, Opera, and Fox. So we know a thing or two about advertising, and specifically traditional and mobile advertising. The opportunity is a $45 billion marketplace huge. And we're a small company that is growing at a fast rate, and Sacha will get into some of these numbers a little later, 
uh, in this ecosystem. And so Sabio continues to execute, and that's why brands, why, you know, the question I get asked a lot is, well, Aziz, why do brands work with you? How do you work with the McDonald's? And if you look online, you could see a multi-year uh, press release with McDonald's and ourselves because we're helping them solve the issue of reaching those diverse audiences in the sex group. And if you're McDonald's, 12 to 24 is your target audience, not old people like me. Highly started streaming ads are critical and multicultural and non-Hispanic whites as this, this uh, ecosystem, especially as it relates to the US population, continues to change. We've become a key player in that space. And not only as it relates to traditional advertising or the brands we work with, but we're talking about political. Obviously, there's a thing or two that you've probably heard about something going on in the US called uh, presidential elections and, and election cycle. Well, we're fortunate enough to play in that space. And part of the reason we play in that space is our unique value proposition from understanding diverse audiences. I'll get into that a little later. And this really is it. Our unique value proposition is effectively reaching diverse brands, uh, diverse consumers and general market consumers. Now, the way we do this, we created, so as I mentioned, my background, I spent years at um, um, in addition to NBC, Fox, AT&T and Opera, the browser company, and when I was at AT&T and Opera, what I realized was how important the app was. This is in 20, you know, I worked at, uh, uh, at Opera roughly around uh, 2013 and AT&T a little before that. And what I realized very quickly that that app is going to be a critical component of, the, of everything into our ecosystem. And so we trademark app science in 2016. And so if you think about it, a mobile app and a streaming app are apps. And we're one of the only companies in the space, one of the very few companies in the space that's actually connecting those two worlds, connecting that mobile data to streaming data. And how do we do this? Without getting too much into the weeds, we have roughly about 280 million mobile IDs that flow through every month. We cross-reference them with 110 CTV devices. That gives us 55 million rich households of the US. Now, to give you some sort of comparison, Nielsen has 40,000 households in the US, 40,000 survey households. We have 55 million. And why that matters is a person like me who was born in India, came to the US when I was five, if you group me into a, a traditional Indian or Muslim family, you'd be wrong. I'm the biggest gin drinker, and I you know, don't tend to eat curry as much as you know, some of my fellow Indians. And so the idea is, to help reach diverse audiences in a mindset basis, not simply based off my name, Aziz Rahim Tula. And so we work, as I mentioned, the biggest brands. Oh, let me just back up. And so what we do is, just to back up, how does this work? So we'll work with, for example, the McDonald's, and we'll say to McDonald's, McDonald's will say to us, Sabio, help us reach diverse moms or Hispanic moms um, who are likely to go to Starbucks at least twice a week. So what we'll do is we will then use our platform, our household graph, to better understand visitation. So we'll look for moms with apps, moms with kids apps in the home. We'll group those people. We'll look for Hispanic areas of concentration. We'll group that. And then finally, we'll look for visitation to a Starbucks. We'll combine those signals in a privacy compliant way, CCPA and GDPR compliant. Those are acronyms that, you know, in the ad tech world you can look up and very important. So we're CCPA, GDPR compliant, we add this all up, and now we do that effective targeting. But not only do we effectively target on the front end and help them reach these audiences, but then we provide them insights on the back end. And so as we'll get into execution, that's why we have a 91% reoccurring revenue model. It is basically the brands we work with come back and work again with us and over and over again. We've been working with the likes of, for example, Wells Fargo since 2015. We've been working with Ford since 2015 and some of these other major brands for many years. And exactly what I just mentioned on the brand side. And here's an example, you know, once again, we did a multi-year deal with McDonald's that we did a press release on and that was after a, another multi-year deal we announced with a domestic automaker, which I didn't want to be named, but there was a press release talking about it. So, you know, why we win? First of all, end-to-end -end solution. We have efficiencies because we've built our own tech stack. We continue to refine it. Now, you know, everyone talks about AI and they talk about all the great things that are happening in the world. AI, the fundamental basis of AI is machine learning. And unless you have enough data and the machine learning components, you really don't have AI. And so 
as a company, as a small company, we have been doing machine learning since 2017, 2016, 2017. That's why we trademarked AppScience. We uh, validated footprint, we validate how we're reaching consumers, diverse audience experience, and then finally deliver strong results, as I mentioned. I'm gonna hand it over to Sajid Premji, our CFO, to talk about our business execution a little bit. Thanks, Aziz. So we have seen a significant amount of growth since going public, and I think that you know, before we get into the 2024 results, it's important to take a step back and see how we've grown over the last few years um, in these non-political years and political years. And so when you look at these non-political years, that has really been driven by a strong core branded business, led a bit of like said, McDonald's, Toyota, et cetera, that is growing at a kegger of 37% a year, or 36% over time. If you look at these political years, we're seeing an, an even bigger bump just due to our, our ability to target different audiences, and you're seeing a kegger of 86% in these political years. In the last political year, 2022, was a midterm election year. We had our best year ever, 42.3 million US of sales. And this year, as Aziz mentioned, is a presidential year. That means a lot more spending, a lot more opportunity for growth. Um, if you look, you know, CNN had an article that, that, that came out just last week saying that this is going to be the closest election of the century. And that means a lot of spending in the swing states, a lot of spending across the country, particularly towards the end of Q3 and early Q4 in October, November. And we are definitely going to be a beneficiary of this spend that we're going to get to in the next slide. And so if we go up to over to 2024, looking at Q2, we had the, the best Q2 in our company's history on both the top line and the bottom line. You know, if you look at the high level picture, we grew our top line revenues by 11% to 8.9 million US from 8 million the year before. But, you know, if you look at underneath that kind of hood, you're going to see a lot of underlying strength. Our ad supported business, which is really the growth pillar of our company, grew 39% year over year to uh, 6.9 million from, uh, from the previous year's 4.9 million. And, and, and through that ad supported growth of 39%, you know, that's a continuation of growth we saw in Q1 of 29%. So the first half of the year, that business grew 34%. And if you take a step back, the, the, the connected, streaming, connected TV streaming market grew at an average of 16% for 2024. And so we are outpacing that market and taking market share. And if you look what's happening is, you know, in our company, our sales mix from ad supported streaming was 77% in Q2, the same as in Q1, up from 64% in the prior year. And if you look at those kind of trends, you know, not, we're not only riding the tide of a growing industry, of, of, of a growing channel in digital advertising and taking market share, but streaming TV is a lot more efficient than mobile display advertising. The deal sizes are bigger. There is, it's, it's a lot easier operationally to get it off the ground. And it's also leading to better customer retention rates. As Aziz had spoken about, we have a 91% recurring revenue rate in the first part of this year. That's up from 74% last year, up from the mid-50s in 2021. So our customers are quite sticky. And what's really impressive about our first half results is that 70% of our top customers who spent with us in 2023 increased their spend with us in 2024. So they're not only coming back, but they're increasing their spend with us. And that's a great opportunity to land and expand going forward because 28% of the brands that we did business with in the first half of the year were new logos, presenting a great opportunity for us to expand our reach into them in the upcoming quarters ahead. And as excited we are about the top line, and we were definitely excited for that, we're even more excited for what's happening on the bottom line. I guess, you know, to take a step back, we know what it takes to run a profitable company. We were profitable in 2020, 2021, 2022. The one outlier in that was 2023, and we're, we're here to show you that that was an anomaly and upstart of a new trend. Um, you know, taking a step back to 2022, we had our, the best year in our company's history, as I mentioned, during that midterm election year, 42.3 million of sales and 1.3 million of positive EBITDA. What happened was that, you know, that great year was kind of masking some of the warts in our operating infrastructure, and those warts came to sunlight in 2023. And, and, and by that, I mean that you saw this big transition in our company from being a company getting, getting most of its sales from mobile advertising, mobile display advertising to streaming revenue. Um, back in 2020, less than 10% of our sales were from streaming advertising. 
um, as I mentioned right now, in the first half of this year, that's 77%. That's a fast transition in a short amount of time. And we had a lot of, a lot of legacy positions that were more tailored towards the, comp the company that we were focused on mobile display advertising than the company that we were today focused on streaming advertising. And so we did some uh, cost cutting uh, midway through 2023, really right sized our infrastructure to kind of, you know, cut back on those positions that weren't reflective of who we are today. And also kind of, you know, call some of our, wor our worst performing people in the company, uh, giving those who are performing better and more opportunities going forward. And that has really benefited our company on the, on the bottom line. You're seeing, you know, in Q1, we curbed our EBITDA loss by 900K year over year. In Q2, we curbed that loss by 1.7 million, sorry, by, 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 by 1.4 million year over year. And, and what does that mean? Well, you know, in 20, I mentioned in 2020, 2021, 2022, we were profitable. In all three years, we lost money in the first half of the year. We made money in the last half of the year. That's where 70% of our sales come in, and, they know, and that's advertising, right? You have the Christmas, back to school, et cetera, all happening in the last part of the year. And so what we basically are, are, are telling you right now is that, you know, by cutting our, our, our loss to $1.6 million for the first half of the year, that's our lowest loss since we're coming a public company exiting the first half of the year. And as I kind of mentioned, 2023, the last half was a disappointment for us. And even if we had that same disappointing, you know, second half, which is not gonna happen, I mean, it's a political year, we have so many drivers, but let's say it did happen, we'd still be profitable for the year. And so, you know, we're in a much better shape. And, you know, we're definitely going to be profitable this year. We said that in our last earnings call. Um, we said that we have a, the potential of being profitable by the end of Q3. We, we, we still stand by that remark, I think. And, and well, and the kind of question we get asked is, well, okay, great. This is an election year. You're going to have a great year. Well, what happens next year in 2025? Well, you know, the great thing about this unusual U.S. presidential election year was that there was a change at the top of the ticket between Harris and Biden, right? And so that really caused a pause in political spending that we were expecting to happen in Q2 this year. We actually got very little political dollars in Q2 this year, less than 400K. Political and advocacy is a, is a, is a category was actually down year over year from 2023 because advocacy tends to come in in the latter half of the year and in the political year. And so all of that to say is that our core business grew by over 20% in the first half of the year, and that bodes very well for 2025. And that's even without the new offerings we have on the table, such as the programmatic streaming TV offering. And so we're very excited for the, for the year ahead. We have a much better cost basis. We learn from the, uh, you know, from the, from the past, and we're definitely in a much better shape than we've ever been before. And what we're seeing right now is we're seeing, you know, like a lot of people here today, we feel that we're undervalued, but I think is what you're seeing right now is that after Q1 and Q2, the market is starting to slowly recognize that as well. You know, our stock is up over 40% year to date. Um, we've doubled off our lows uh, of, of the year, and we're going to continue that trend because, you know, we, we, we still feel that we're, we are very undervalued. If you look at our market capitalization, it's 17 million or so U.S. dollars. Um, if you look at the analyst estimates for this year, they're around 47 million U.S. Um, you know, that's a little, a little over 60 million Canadian. And, you know, that's what we believe is a huge valuation gap on, on, the, on the sales basis. Um, before I get into those valuation metrics, I think that one thing that's worth putting out that's on this slide here is that 60% of the company is owned by insiders. Uh, the biggest shareholder is Aziz of 47%. His interest is very much aligned with the, that of the shareholders. Aziz does not have a side job or a side gig. He's all in on this. And this, is, this isn't his net worth. This is a lot of our officers' net worth as well. So we are very motivated to get this stock up. And if you're going to go over to this valuation slide and these comparables, you know, this is, you know, if you look at the, on, our sales, on the sales basis, you know, trading under 1x, you know, we've been saying for a long time that this is kind of, this is kind of really surprising given where we are. Um, but the not thing that we've received in the past is, well, yes, you're under 1x on a sales basis, but on a profitability standpoint, you know, we believe that you are actually fairly, fairly valued. Well, now that we have turned the ship, if you look at these metrics on the, on, the, on the right hand, we're actually undervalued compared to our peers on the EBITDA estimates for this year as well. So we're not, we're not, we're not only undervalued on the top line, now we're undervalued on the bottom line. So we feel this is a very compelling entry point before we release Q3, which will be the best Q3 in the history of this company.
Thank you, Sajid. Uh, thank you, Sajid. Um, and, you know, this is a key slide based off what Sajid just mentioned, how our motivations are aligned with that of investors, but yet we also have an independent board that is an incredible board that challenges us and makes sure that they're defending and protecting, obviously, uh, the interests of shareholders. Um, some key people I'll call out on this board, Paula Madison uh, was a GE officer, um, formerly in, in Mentor Minds. Matt Hull, who recently joined our board, um, it works at Chamberlain, you know, the garage door company that um, Blackstone purchased for $5 billion. So he's the head of insights and analytics there, and he just joined our board. So we have a great board. We have incredible people uh, across our organization, and really, we are set up to win. Um, Q3 last year, we had some challenges, and the challenges, I, I believe in addressing them. Challenges were connected to automotive strike. It was connected to some of the strikes we had. And that also, to Saj's point, led us to rethink our strategy as it relates to structure and realizing what we needed to do is create more efficiency and operating leverage, and we did that. Instead of raising capital at the NQ3, we increased our operating leverage. We cut costs, and that is how we operate because we're not interested in running a company or a term that I've recently heard, a lifestyle company. We're interested in running a real company where the profits are actually real, and that is what we're doing. We're executing well. We're not only going to have a great year this year, but as Sajid mentioned, our year-to-year -year comps for the first half of next year are not concerning to us. Um, we didn't get any benefits from real political. In fact, in Q2, some of the advocacy, and for those of you who are not familiar with advocacy, advocacy is when um, the U.S. Postal Service asked the congressman to spend on them and fund their business, uh, fund their operation, or Meta says, hey, listen, you know what, we are a good uh, partner for the communities. That's advocacy. And so advocacy this year shifted out of the election cycle, and despite that, uh, we had uh, one of the best Q2s in, in company history since, since going public. So we're set up uh, well. We were only 300,000 um, negative EBITDA in Q2. We really probably had a shot at being positive uh, EBITDA in Q2, adjusted positive EBITDA in Q2, and that's really what we're focused in on. We're not one of these high-flying tech companies that are just interested in top line. We actually generally care about making money. On that note, happy to take any questions. The competition and what? And the moat. The mo oh, yeah. So competition-wise, we work with, we compete with some major companies like the Trade Desk. Uh, we, we compete with Magnite. Um, those are our two closest competitors as well as Roku. And our moat goes back to this household graph. Um, not only is it because we built our own tech, but this household graph is really our differentiation and our focus, once again, in diverse audiences. We're the only company of those three that has only focused in on in-app, whether it's an app on mobile or an app on TV. There are synergies and efficiencies connected to that and understanding on that. So that really is where we continue, the likes of the McDonald's and some of these major brands, the reason they continue working with us is they're trying to better understand that diverse audience marketplace and we're the specialists there. And it grow, it's growing, right? Like diverse audiences continue to grow in the US. Once again, 49 to 50% of Gen Z are diverse and growing. So that number is going up along with streaming numbers. So we're in, we're in a perfect growth vector in both areas. We, we had continued growth, as Sajid pointed out. I mean, ad tech, it depends on the sector. So if you are playing in, for example, the mobile app sector or mobile display ads, there's some challenges ahead. Facebook dealt with challenges because of the change of the Apple ID situation. So it depends on the sector. If you're dealing with traditional TV, you've got a problem on your hands. You're, you're running out of room as a company. Cable companies are in trouble. Magazines have been in trouble for a while. Streaming TV is the bright spot growing at a faster rate as a segment than any other segment in, in uh, from my understanding, and then we could check this, but it's one of the fastest growing segments and might be one of the, uh, the fastest growing segments, so. Yeah, 
Yeah, in, oh, sorry, Saj, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so I think that, you know, what, what you're probably going to see is, especially when you offer a programmatic offering, um, is that, you know, that business tends to be uh, lower on the growth margin, but higher on the EBITDA margin. And so you might see some uh, growth margin pressures next year just due to that, but you might see some EBITDA expansion or, or protection. So, you know, for this year, the analysts have this kind of estimate on an EBITDA margin between 5 and 10%. I think that's fair. I think that we probably hold that in 2020. Five, and I think in 2026, we see a great opportunity for us to really expand that because once you get past that kind of 50 million U.S. revenue threshold, more of those incremental dollars go straight to the bottom line. And so that's where we're really seeing those economies of scale and the opportunity to really expand even the margins. And, and that's exactly a great point, Saj. We're at a very interesting inflection point as a company. We're at that point now. We're at that point where more drops to the bottom line. And that is just going to get better as we continue to increase our scale, our size. Great. Well, thank you, everyone.